1. Tom had always been friends with my friends throughout high school. He was a quiet art kid who had insane natural talent. Seemed nice enough. But despite always wearing a smile, he just gave people, girls mostly, the feeling that something was off with him. I never spent a lot of one-on-one -on -one time with him because of this, but I never had any reason to believe he was dangerous. Just weird. Anyways, years after high school, I reconnect with my high school sweetheart, Jamie, who happens to be best friends with Tom. Everything was going great for Jamie and me. We were married, starting a family, remodeling an old family home on acres of land that was our own, the dream. Tom would visit regularly and had become a regular staple at gatherings. He did have a weapons fascination and liked to brag on himself, but nothing that made him seem threatening. Tom by this time had married a woman who was old enough to be our mothers. These two were not a healthy, cohesive couple, super codependent and apparently they had gotten physical with one another. From what Tom told us, though, she would flip back and attack him. Not an excuse for him. I still thought they both needed help. In the midst of this, though, Tom had started drinking and lying about his drinking, getting two DWIs and showing up at our house drunk. Jimmy had told him to show up sober or don't come over at all. I was pregnant, and he didn't want that at our home. Months go by, no word from Tom. That is, until one day he calls my husband wanting to chat. He sounds very depressed. I'm about six months along at this time. Jamie has him come by and they chat outside. He wants to leave his wife, good for him. But something isn't right. Even more so than normal. Jamie sneaks to his scooter. You can drive these without a license here. We call them DWI mobiles. While Tom uses our restroom and Jamie sees a bottle of vodka. While Jamie is still outside, Tom all of a sudden doesn't have to use the restroom anymore. He turns to me and looks me up and down, so cold and expressionless. You know, Jess, women are most beautiful when they're pregnant. You've never been more gorgeous. He makes a move to get closer to me, but by this time, Jamie is walking in. Come outside, we need to talk. Shortly afterwards, I hear Tom leave and Jamie tells me about the alcohol. I tell him about the creepy comment, and we both agree that he can't be trusted. He was not welcome here until he got help. Tom stopped calling, no texts, nothing. Jamie reached out to make sure he was okay, no response. From what we heard from his family, he was okay, just working and staying busy trying to keep sober. We really hoped he was taking care of himself. Months later, and I am eight months pregnant. I am no longer working, preterm labor, and Jamie works six days a week. That's a lot of time alone. His schedule was always the same, and he had not changed in years. Randomly on a day Jamie was at work, Tom shows up at our house at 10 a.m., I usually napped around that time because I was huge and tired. Luckily, I was awake and in our front room. It had a huge window that faced our driveway, and the door led to our garage. I shot him a nervous wave through my window. He didn't seem to see me and was grabbing something out of a duffel on his scooter. He pulled out a shotgun. I know there's fight or flight, but I just froze. He takes a swig of something, guessing whiskey because of the bottle and color, and suddenly notices me, sheer horror on my face. In return, I get a hateful look. He says something I can't hear, then smiles. Not a happy smile. Packs up his gun and leaves. I immediately call Jamie. He didn't answer. I text totally freaked out and checking locks. Jamie calls back about ten minutes later. As we are talking, trying to make sense of what just happened, Jamie's dad, who lives just down the road, calls. Tom tried to break into his home. Thankfully, Jamie's dad is always armed. He caught him red-handed, but doesn't call the cops because of their long-standing friendship with Tom's family, and the fact that they had bailed my husband out as a wild teenager. Apparently, he hadn't had his gun out when he caught him, so it didn't feel threatened. Not happy about that, but wasn't my choice. That alone was scary and super confusing, but what Jamie told me later really freaked me out. 
When I was working, I worked a set schedule, except for occasionally I'd be called in. One day, a month prior to my incident, Jamie called in sick and I was called in to work. I hated leaving him sick, but duty called. Jamie said he had been napping a little after nine due to a high fever. He had awoken at some point to the sound of doors opening and closing, but was so out of it and figured it must have been his imagination. Fever dreams are wild. What woke him and kept him at least semi-alert, though, was the bell on our bedroom door, our dog jingles it to potty in the morning. And FYI, this dog is overly friendly. He'd be the dog to show an intruder to the most valuable stuff to steal. He heard it jingle twice lightly. He vaguely remembers looking up and seeing what looked like Tom at the end of the bed staring at him, not moving. He said he passed out from the fever, it was getting worse, and came to not much longer. He was gone. So Jamie figured it was just the fever messing with him. He wasn't so sure anymore. It's been over two years and we make no attempts to talk to Tom. He used to drive by from time to time, but never tried to make contact. That has stopped, but I still make sure all of my locks and windows are secure. Tom, let's not meet ever again. 2. For some context, I live in a small Caribbean island, in a middle-class neighbourhood with my wife and two-year-old daughter. My townhouse is located in a quiet cul-de-sac. On one side of the house is the main street and a shared driveway. On the other side is a very private courtyard, completely out of sight of the road which is shared with two other townhouses that are very isolated. Beyond the courtyard is an overgrown bush and an abandoned house under construction with boarded up windows. This house almost sits on top of the courtyard, and just has a bad vibe all the time. All of my windows face the courtyard, the bush, and the abandoned house. There were many nights I'd be playing PS4 and just catch a weird vibe that someone was watching me from the bush. I eventually got blackout curtains but still felt eyes on my back. Like whoever it was could see the illumination from the TV and know I was awake. Things got real about three weeks ago. My daughter is starting school in April and my wife is a stay-at-home mom, so they are usually home during the day while I'm at work. I work 9 to 5. It was a Wednesday evening and my wife asked if I could drop her and my daughter to a nearby mall to do some shopping on my way to work. I picked them up around 11am, dropped them home and quickly headed back to the office. I work in a small company and the flexibility with time is great. Around 12.30pm, while my wife was in the kitchen, one of my neighbours started pounding on our door. My next door neighbour across the courtyard had just come home, walked around by her very isolated back door, and found that someone had broken the glass door on their patio facing the bush. I returned home to check the scene out, and we waited for police. We had no idea who it was. All we knew is that the break-in occurred between 10am and 12pm while everyone's cars were gone. My wife is usually home at this time, but this day she was out. What bothered me was that the houses are all built the same way, with the same doors. I was properly creeped out at this point and asked my wife to not open the blinds and curtains so wide while she was home alone. A week passed by and everything seems normal again, or as normal as can be. The incident is still in all our minds, but we get on with life. Another week passes by and it's a Tuesday night. I was awake playing this game called Fortune until about 1.30am. I decided it was getting late and headed downstairs for a snack. Came back up and lay down reading the sub before I drifted off. I remember around 2am I heard what sounded like three bangs that made me pause. I told myself it was the wind. But when I looked outside, the night was deadly quiet. It wasn't windy at all. I remember checking every window and even turning off the fans in the house so I could hear more clearly. The voice in my head kept saying that those bangs sounded human. It sounded like someone was doing something, but I couldn't see anything and drifted off to sleep again. Around 3.45am, I was awoken by the neighbor's dogs across from my driveway on the main street barking. I usually would just go back to sleep, but my body shot up and I felt cold. 
I rushed to the window facing the driveway and saw a tall Rasta man pulling the door handles on all the cars. I wanted to shout at him in my accent, Yo, what the fuck ya doin'? Get to fuck out from here. But again, I paused. As he walked away down the street, I realized he was holding a machete. That night, I couldn't get back to sleep. I called the police to inform them what I saw, but they never came. The next morning, Wednesday, I messaged all my neighbors to let them know what I saw the night before. Everyone was on edge that morning, wondering what the fuck was going on. My neighbor with the dogs had surveillance cameras facing my driveway, and caught the prowler as he moved around the houses, checking windows, doors and cars confirming what I had seen. He had disappeared into the courtyard out of sight for a while that night. I left for work at 9am, and the last thing I told my wife was to close the blinds a bit more. I just had a weird vibe coming from the bush. Around 10.30am I receive a call from my wife. I stupidly cancelled it, and tried video calling her back to chat with my daughter. She ended it immediately and a call came through again. This time I answered and it's like everything in my world stopped. She was whispering and in tears. She sounded very scared. All I heard was, there is a man beating on the door right now in the courtyard. My fucking phone battery died at this point. I was in a state of panic. I rushed to my car and flew home in under 10 minutes. I pulled into the courtyard area so damn hard and fast and ran into the middle cursing that this shit can't be happening again. Fortunately, the man had not broken down my door, but my neighbor's door again. It was smashed. I wasn't even expecting what happened next. I thought the man was in and out. The same Rasta man I saw at 4am came flying out the door with a large knife, hopped over a fence and ran away through the bushes, collecting a backpack he had stashed away. After the police arrived and the neighbours up the hill came out, we all started talking and a picture of what happened that morning became clear. My neighbour who lives up the hill from us saw a man enter my neighbour's yard and walk to the back door after she left for work. He then watched as the man hammered and chiseled out a door with a deadbolt. He called the police in the hopes they'd come and catch him. That didn't happen. The man chiseled at the door for 15 minutes. This time my wife was in the kitchen and was hearing hammering but couldn't see him as he was in a blind spot from our home. She went to check the living room by the courtyard and heard our back door knob start violently shaking. She ran back to the kitchen and the noise had stopped. When she looked through the courtyard window, the man was staring right back at her. He then proceeded to my neighbor's other glass door, and in one hit, he was inside. My wife ran upstairs with my daughter and locked herself in the bedroom and called me. The police took over 30 minutes to show up that morning, and my wife refuses to go back to the house. As most days, she's the only one in the cul-de-sac when everyone is out. We were renting the place, so she packed all our belongings, and we are currently in temporary accommodation, looking for another home that isn't so isolated. Gonna get a dog as well, when we move to stay in the house with her. She says the man is still out there, and she feels like he will come back for her one morning, if we don't move. 3. When I was young I learned the hard way that it isn't just strangers who can be a threat. At the time, my father was a recovering alcoholic, and during my teen years, the family would sometimes go to events for his AA group. Over time, I came to view everyone in AA there as extended family. I'm totally going to credit that group with saving my dad's life and sanity. And this post is not to be construed in any way as talking bad about AA, it's not. It's just explaining why I wasn't more on my guard over one particular individual in it. So let me explain. One of the people that I adored in the group was a woman named Gina. She was beautiful, funny, and completely the cool aunt, slash big sister every teenage girl wishes they had. During a particular AA get-together when I was 15, she introduced me to someone new to the group named Joey. Now Joey scared me. He was a huge guy with a massive scar running down the side of his face and a big booming voice. But both my dad and Gina seemed to like him. He treated me like a little kid, and barely noticed me any time I'd see him in a group. So I kind of mentally decided he was as okay as everyone else in the group, 
and didn't pay any further attention to him. We saw each other sporadically, but he wasn't close to my parents, so I kind of lost track of him. After I turned 18, I moved out of my parents' house and in with a couple of roommates in a larger town, 15 miles from my parents. I got a job at a fast food joint, and my parents gifted me a used car to get around in. One day the car wouldn't start, so I called my dad about it. He told me he couldn't come get me just then, so I told him I'd walk to work and he could pick me up at 6pm, and then come over and look at the car. With that agreed upon, I took off for work. It was only a 20 minute walk from my house. I'd done it before, no biggie, right? And then it started to rain and I hadn't brought an umbrella. Several people pulled up to offer rides, but I refused and continued on holding my jacket over my head while cussing out the car that had betrayed me. I wasn't stupid. I read my grandmother's true crime magazines, so I was very aware of what could happen to young female hitchhikers. So it looked like I was just going to have to walk in the rain. I had about ten minutes to go when a familiar car pulled off the highway in front of me. I peered through the window and saw Joey with that unmistakable scar on his face waving at me. A friend, I thought, and waved back as he opened the passenger door for me. I just assumed he knew me, so the conversation wasn't really anything more than how is your day going and why are you walking in the rain? When I told him about the car he laughed and said, Tough break. Then offered me a cigarette. He then started asking me odd questions like where I went to school and did I have a boyfriend? So I started to feel a little uneasy, although I just thought he was being a bit of a nosy adult. And then we drove right past my workplace. I was like, oh hey, you missed a turn off to Bob's. Joey stopped laughing then, and didn't say anything, but he turned off the main highway and onto a winding paved road that I recognized as being a residential area. I started to feel uneasy. Hey, you were supposed to drop me off. Can you turn around, please? Then he smiled and looked over at me. How about you come to my place instead? And that's when it dawned on me Joy wasn't going to take me to work. I tried to play it cool. No, I'd get fired if I didn't show up, sorry. Please take me back. He stared at me a moment, then turned his eyes back to the road. Maybe later. Right now you need to repay me for this ride. I felt my eyes start to water and my knees buckle as I realized I was in some guy's car. No one knew where I was. I didn't know where I was. And while there were houses around us, they were fairly set back from the road. I was on my own. At that moment, I remembered I did have one possible out. So I slid one hand into my handbag to feel around for the other gift my parents had given me when I left home. A small 38 special my dad had told me to always keep on me, just in case. It suddenly dawned on me Joey was huge, built like a linebacker. And that little handgun I had might not do anything but piss him off. But it was all I had. So I fumbled for it while I scooted closer to the passenger door. I sort of opened my bag and slid the gun into my jacket pocket, mentally preparing myself to have to use it. I wasn't a stranger to guns, but I'd been raised you just never use one unless it's life or death. Well, this was probably one of those times, so I started to mentally calculate when or where to fire a shot to stop him if I had to do so. Joey wasn't looking at me, so he hadn't noticed what I was doing. He was just driving along with this kind of mean little smirk on his face, and then he said, You should have known better than to get in a car with a strange man, little girl. That comment sort of snapped me out of my panic and made me angry. Well, normally I wouldn't, but since you know my dad, I figured you'd be okay. At that, he slowed down and pulled off to the side of the road. Wait, who's your dad? I told him my dad's nickname, the one only his AA buddies and close family knew. Joey went white, and that's when it dawned on me that Joey hadn't pulled over, because he knew me. He was just a creep who saw an opportunity to pick up what he believed was a young, defenseless girl. He stammered out, Your dad would kill me! I nodded in agreement, seeing this as a possible turn of events in my favour. Yeah, him and Gina too. She's a close friend of mine, you know. Joey sat there staring at me for what felt like an eternity while mumbling, Oh shit, oh shit, over and over to himself. 
Then he turned away from me and kind of started rocking back and forth, closing his eyes and having what I can only describe as a bit of a nervous breakdown. Seeing my opportunity, I told him, Look, man, I'm not going to say anything, but I'm getting out of here and you don't follow me, got it? And then, not waiting for an answer, I popped open the passenger door, flew across the road into a nearby field, and ran for my life, not stopping until I got to the highway. Even so, going back towards my job was a tense experience, with every sense heightened, and one hand gripping my little handgun now tucked into my coat pocket. I was sure Joey was going to change his mind and come for me, to cover up what he'd nearly done. But I made it to work, sweat pouring off me, mixed with tears and shaking. My boss never noticed, he just lectured me on the importance of being on time. My co-workers covered my shift while I got myself cleaned up, and I told everyone I just had my car blow a flat and my dad was going to pick it up. I was having a hard time processing the thought. Did I nearly just get kidnapped and raped, or worse? By someone I thought I could trust. So at the time, it didn't dawn on me. I should just tell everyone what had happened. I finished my shift in a daze. Then when my dad picked me up from work, I thought about telling him what had happened. But in the end, I didn't tell my dad, because Joy's reaction to who my father was freaked me out so badly. I mean, my dad only came to Joey's shoulder. But the way Joey had reacted, you'd have thought my dad was Al Capone. So, opted to go to someone else instead, Gina. She was freaked out and furious, and told me Joey had been kicked out of AA after being overly aggressive towards several of the women there. No one had seen him in months, and she was horrified I'd gotten into the car with him apologizing for ever having introduced us. I told her it wasn't her fault. She asked me if I told my father, and I said I hadn't, to which she also told me. Don't, I'll take care of it. Her husband was a state patrol officer at the time, and I don't know what they did because she wouldn't tell me. A few years later, I bumped into Gina and went out for a coffee. I asked her if she remembered Joey and what had happened. She told me he was in prison, but wouldn't tell me why. My father passed away shortly after that. R.I.P. Daddy. To this day, I don't understand why Joey was so afraid of my father, but I'm glad he was. It saved me from probably a really horrifying situation I may well not have gotten out of intact. Yes, I had a gun, so it still might have been I could have gotten away. Or it could have made things worse. I'll never know. So yeah, Joey and I never met again. And to this day, I still have no idea why he was so afraid of my dad. Hey everybody, Hellfreezer here, and thank you very much for listening to Three True Scary Stories, episode 270. Thank you very much to everybody who allowed me to use their stories in this video. Just a reminder, if you have any questions for the Q&A, just pop them in the, any video really, just whatever, wherever you feel. I'll do screen caps of them and gather them over the course of a couple of months. And when I have enough, I'll do the q and I'm not in a rush to do it, so there's no rush to get your questions in. Okay, and with that, I'm going to head off for now. So until next time, thank you very much for listening, and take very good care of yourselves.